I don't think I've ever felt this way about any movie or it's just been too long. Dune completely blew me away. It was such a good movie. I was so immersed in that universe. I never wanted it to end. Take me to Arrakis. Or not really, because I'll probably die in like a day. The most anticipated movie for me for the past two years of my life. Ever since I watched Dune part one, I have been waiting for Dune part two. Part one was kind of just like a slow burn buildup. And part two is like this final climax to the conclusion. It was so good. Everything about it just works so well, so harmoniously. The sound, the music, the visuals, it's stunning. You really have to see it in the theater though. If I had watched this in my house, I probably would not have been so immersed in that world. The moment it began with that voice speaking in Sardaukar, I was like, oh my god, it's starting. The excitement never ended. It was just so gripping. I just want to talk about the things that really stood out to me, that really made me think a lot about the themes in this movie. Or those just like little points that stood out. These are topics that I'm probably going to remember for a very long time. I also forget to mention that there are going to be spoilers. I didn't realize that I kind of spoiled a lot of part two in my first video. If you're familiar with this channel, I say that like this is a big channel. It's a very small channel, but if you're familiar with my videos, you'll know that I always spoil everything. I'm always going to spoil stuff. Part two really picks off where part one left off. Paul is going into the desert. He's joined the Fremen. House Atreides is no more, or at least everyone else thinks that's the case, but then Paul is secretly survived and he is like trying to join the Fremen. Half of them believe that he's the Messiah and the other half are just like, he's not one of us. He could potentially be dangerous. Eventually he proves himself to the Fremen that he can be one of them. Kind of rises up within the ranks and then he becomes sort of a leader. Paul himself does not believe he's the Messiah. He does not believe he's the Kwisau Chaturach or what the Fremen would call the Lisan Al Gaib. Oh my God, I'm gonna like butcher these I always butcher names. He doesn't want to be the chosen one, even though his mom, Jessica, forces him into it. And there's so many situations in this that force him to become this messiah guy that we've all been waiting for. The first portion of this film, you kind of see him try to avoid it. He knows that if he goes down that path, it's going to lead to the death of billions of people. And he doesn't want that. Deep down, he's still trying to be a good person. But everything around him, all of the circumstances kind of point him toward that path. And eventually he finds it unavoidable. Like it's in inevitable that he becomes the messiah, the one that was written in the storybooks. It's actually really funny because there's this character named Stilgar. <laughs> He's like kind of comedic relief in this because every time he does something, Stilgar's always like, oh my god, it's just as it was written. One of the most interesting debates in this movie is whether or not Paul was really destined to be the Lisan al Gai, or if it was because the Bene Gesserits instilled this ideology in the Fremen from the very beginning and they continue to influence that thought. Jessica plays a huge role here too because she's literally trying to convince everyone that her son Paul is the chosen one. So I know this whole story, this whole story of Dune is about Paul being sort of a tragic villain. The more I thought about it, I don't know if I'm missing something. What other choice did he have? Freeing the Fremen was a very heroic effort. I don't know why they emphasize the fact that he didn't want to be the one because he wanted the Fremen to free themselves. He didn't want to be the outsider that came and saved the day. So if the Fremen had a leader that rose up the ranks and led them to freedom, how exactly is that different? I must be missing something. Maybe it's because if Paul led them to freedom and just stopped right there instead of becoming emperor and oppressing the rest of the universe, this Fremen leader would have just stopped at freeing the Fremen. I don't know. Couldn't he have potentially also tried to become the next emperor? Maybe it has to do with bloodlines? I don't know what qualifies someone to become the emperor. Eventually your empire is gonna fall. I don't think there's a single empire out there that has lasted forever. And every time a ruling class is overthrown, there's bloodshed. I don't know if I'm just biased and I'm like, I can't really see Paul as a real evil villain. I know Frank Herbert, <laughs> I didn't read the book, but I know that the story he's trying to tell is a cautionary tale. It's not about a good protagonist just becoming the hero. And I'm just like, but then what else would we have done? Imagine if Paul didn't exist. The emperor Shaddam IV would have just been a corrupt emperor. He backstabbed Atreides. Are we just gonna let that slide? If the Harkonnen take power, it's just gonna be another oppressive ruling class. Is it wrong to overthrow the current people in control? 
I don't understand politics enough to be able to speak to that. That's how I felt throughout the whole movie though. Like this movie was one of those movies. You have to be really focused on it. It's not like scrolling TikTok where you're just passively like consuming something or actively Thinking. The whole time I was watching, I never lost focus. I mean, I couldn't even space out, but if I had spaced out, I wouldn't have known what was going on. I would have missed so many things. This movie really makes you actively think about what's happening, and it makes you think beyond what they're showing you. It makes you question so many things, and I think that's one of the things I really loved about this movie, and what really kept my intrigue at a really high level, to the point where I'm just like, my face. I recall there were moments I was watching this that I'm like, I need to relax my face because I was just like, Ugh. I was so stiff because my brain was just completely absorbed in the movie. As Zendaya plays Chani. She was the girl that showed up in Paul's dreams from the first movie and now she's his lover. At first, I was just like, I know they fall in love, but is it gonna happen really awkwardly? But no, it actually felt quite natural. You could really feel that Paul really loved Chani. She also does not want him to be the chosen one. I don't know. She just wants him to be with her, I guess. I don't really know what she wanted him to become. He was climbing up that ladder like she could tell. There was one scene where he's like, if I go south, there's like no turning back. But she kind of convinces him. She's like, yeah, you have to go. So I'm like, it's kind of weird because he already told her the result because he saw the future. And then eventually when he does become the one, she's kind of mad about it. That part I couldn't quite understand. I'm sure she was really stressed out. <laughs> she also is one of the Fremen that don't believe in this messiah. I find it very interesting. The Fremen who believe it, they don't see it as something that was planned. But from the Bene Gesserit point of view, from the people who know what they have done, it was planned from 10,000 years ago when they started that breeding program. I personally, well, I don't want to talk about what I personally believe. Huh. It's one of those very interesting things that keeps you thinking, keeps you on your toes, and it never really gives you the answer. I watched this movie and the whole time I was I was like, oh yeah, Paul is the chosen one. He's the Kwisah Chatterak that the Bene Gesserits were trying to bring to fruition. He's the one. And then after watching this movie, what even is this Kwisah Chatterak? There's one scene where the Reverend Mother, first of all, I thought she also believed that Paul was the Kwisah Chatterak. But then she's like talking to Princess Irulan, Florence Pugh. She's like, we have another prospect. And I'm like, what? I found it very interesting that the Bene Gesserits themselves, they're okay with anyone being the Kwisah Chatterak, as long as everything falls into place according to their plan, all the stars align, that's it, that's the chosen one. It has to be under certain circumstances, but they're not really defined. I don't think they even know themselves, even though they're planning for it, but obviously nothing ever goes exactly to plan. They just have to keep adjusting their plan to finally bring about this outcome. Reverend Mother is like, our other prospect is the Baron Harkonnen's nephew, Bade Rautha, Austin Butler, he is this crazy dude. He is absolutely unhinged. The Reverend Mother thinks that he can be controlled. They leave that path open too. They don't ever just put all their eggs in one basket. And that's probably why they've been around for so long and why they've been so successful in their ways. Jessica actually plays a big role in Paul being forced into this position. She is pregnant with Paul's sister, Aaliyah. She had to drink this water of life to really open up her mind to all of the memories of the previous Reverend Mothers. It opens her mind, but it also opens Aaliyah's mind because Aaliyah is still in her womb. So Aaliyah can communicate with Jessica. Also shows up in one of Paul's visions, an older version of herself, standing on Arrakis with a giant ocean. So that's a sneak preview of the future. And that was a pretty interesting scene. I'm just like, where did the water come from? It's gonna happen, but how? Jessica in this film was very, very intense. She was very sinister, really just planning things, trying to reach this outcome of her son, Paul, being the Kwisah Chatterak. He defeats Fade Ratha in combat before this happens. So after he declares war on the Harkonnens, storms the capital of Arrakan, Emperor's there too, the Baron is there, everybody's there. He walks in, goes straight to the Baron Harkonnen, and he just hi grandpa and then kills him. That was a vengeful act, but I didn't feel like it was evil. I don't think anybody likes the Baron. It was kind of anticlimactic though, because the 
Baron didn't even fight back. He was already on the ground. It was interesting to see the Emperor because when I watched the first movie, I was very curious to see what the Emperor was gonna be like. And I thought he was gonna be this like really cool person, but then he's just this old man drinking tea. He looks like he should be retired. And I don't know if he has other children besides Princess Irulan. Shouldn't he be slowly passing his control to an heir? These people are so power hungry. At the end of the day, they're just sitting there drinking tea. That's probably not what they do all day. But I guess it is one of those stories. You're forced to lust after power because if you don't have power, you're either gonna be oppressed or taken out. Is power something we really want just for the sake of having power or is it like a necessity to survive? Paul just had to rise or else he would have just lost everything. So I don't know if that was the only other choice. It's just like, but at the same time, I guess he doesn't have to necessarily become the emperor. He could just take out the Harkonnens, free the Fremen, and then just stop there. But we all know he kept going. Mm, decided to become the emperor and decided to marry Princess Irulan, which was really sad for Chani. That scene hit me physically when he walks up to Chani and he's like, I'll love you as long as I keep breathing. The next moment he's like, I'm gonna take Princess Irulan's hand in marriage. And then Chani kind of walks out. Her future is up in the air right now. We don't know what she's gonna do. Do Dune part two is actually the end of the first Dune book. So if they do a Dune part three, it's going to be adapting Dune Messiah, which is like the second book. There's this scene at the end when Jessica, she eyes the Reverend Mother and then she's like, hi, you chose the wrong side. The Reverend Mother replies, there are no sides. She addresses Jessica as the new Reverend Mother. She's not even bitter about it. She's just like, I played my role. This is all part of the greater plan that we've all been working towards. I'm conflicted about Paul because I know he's supposed to be the villain. He kind of chose it, but everything around him was pushing him towards this path. I guess he could have ran away with Chani and they could have just lived happily ever after. <laughs> but then at the end of the day, would other situations push him back again? Or you're just kind of left wondering. Something you don't get over. I guess that was the point. The point was to never get over Dune. At the end, he declares that he is going to be the next emperor. All the other great houses are against that. But then instead of backing down, he's like, no, I'm going to force it. And he's going to start this holy war. I find it also interesting that the other houses don't want him to become the next emperor. Then who? I mean, Shaddam was going to die, wasn't he? <laughs> like, he was already old. Someone had to have taken the place. I'm kind of curious to know why the other houses are so against it, that they would be willing to risk the lives of so many people to oppose it, but it's probably explained in the books. Also, I don't understand politics, so I don't know. Please share your thoughts about Dune part two in the comments down below. I would love to hear what kind of themes kept you up at night. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like it's one of those things that would keep you up at night. Oh my God, was he really the prophecy? I think he wasn't though, because I've spoiled myself. You know, when you do research, it's inevitable that you spoil yourself a little bit. I also read that, you know, his son, maybe I shouldn't. Actually, I'm not gonna spoil this for you guys. I'm gonna hold myself back. I'll most likely make more videos about Dune in the future. Glad we got to see a lot more of the worm because every time it pops out of the sand with its big mouth that's like this whirlpool of death. I got like goosebumps. It looks so intimidating. They do a lot of sandworm riding. As I was watching it, I was like, so that's how you get on the sandworm, but how does one get off the sandworm. <laughs>